Merry Christmas. This Christmas Sunday, we call the first Sunday after Christmas, Christmas Sunday. Um, it's technically what the the third day of Christmas or the second day of Christmas, sorry, Christmas, the 12 days of Christmas start on Christmas day. Um, and they go in through until Epiphany, which is January 6th. So, so keep your Advent uh, wreath burning um, to the best of your ability these, these next days as we enter into a season, we hope, of peace and love and joy and renewed hope. Um, Merry Christmas. This morning's worship comes to us as a gift from the New Hampshire Conference and leaders of the New Hampshire Conference. The New Hampshire Conference is our wider setting of ministry um, and includes the United Churches of Christ across the state of New Hampshire. And our conference uh, leadership has, has gifted churches with worship so that our local church staff might have a Sunday off. So I hope that you enjoy these resources. Perhaps you will see some, some faces that are familiar to you. Uh, this includes our music. Our music uh, resources are coming from many places. Um, some of the music that you will hear and uh, experience this morning comes from the conference, and some are gems that I have found um, made by other worship groups and other wonderful groups that have offered their uh, music to us as a gift um, to one another as we all try to lean in and get through these difficult days. Um, in particular, there are a couple music pieces from College Street Church in Burlington, Vermont. Um, a friend of mine who used to live in New Hampshire and, and sit on some conference committees with me has since moved to Burlington, uh, Matt Van Wagner, and, and he offered these resources from his new home church in Burlington. Um, feels like we have a nice connection to the Burlington area. That is not the church that our uh, beloved architect Ann Vivian uh, worships at. It's the one down the street. It's the other UCC church in downtown Burlington. But I think that you will um, enjoy some of these beautiful pieces of music that come to us from, from that church. Uh, let's see, do I have anything else to tell you? I don't think so. Andy and I will be back on your screens uh, next Sunday, Epiphany Sunday, January 3rd, which is of course a communion Sunday as well. Um, so, so bask and relish in these holy days. Uh, I hope your Christmas was good. Um, and I hope that it was a surprisingly uh, good time. I know that many people found that there were hidden gifts of having a smaller, quieter Thanksgiving. So here's to uh, a coming new year of restored health um, and restored community and hope and, and blessings of Christmas tide to you. Let us be in a spirit of worship as we begin with our prelude.
Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. For months now, we have lived with many griefs, the loss of loved ones, the loss of employment, the loss of traditional celebrations, the loss of sacred ritual, and the loss of connection. But today, the echoes of the angels still ring in our ears. Do not be afraid, for I am bringing you good news of great joy for all people. Before this week is over, we will begin a new year. There are glimpses of new life being born among us, but it still feels like the nights are quite long. Yet today, the echoes of angels still ring in our ears. Do not be afraid for I am bringing you good news of great joy for all your people. Soon the crushes and the ornaments will be put away for another year. So as we gather ourselves for worship, let us steep ourselves in the beautiful, holy interruption of Christmas season. For in every day, we need to continue to hear the echoes of angels ringing in our ears. Do not be afraid for I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. Once in royal David city stood a lowly cattle shed
Let us bow our heads and join in prayer. Holy One, so often we seek to find Christmas in song, in scent, in cards and carols, in garland and gifts. Remind us again today how love incarnate was born to a world that was in darkness, unprepared, and had no room left for holy surprise. More importantly, allow us to see that it is so often where your love is born. Help us this day to become swaddlers, those who not only care for your precious gift, but wrap it tightly so it may travel with us into the normal, oh, not so normal days of our lives. We offer these words and all the words of our worship in the name of Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. Luke chapter 2, lines 1 through 20. In those days, a decree went out to Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea in the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was an angel with the angel, a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard as it had been told to them.
as some of you know, I grew up as a PK, a preacher's kid. As a matter of fact, the earliest days of my life that I remember are when my father served as pastor right down the road from where I live now at the First Congregational Church of Hampton. Now, I want to encourage you not to believe all the rumors you hear about PKs. They're not all true, but there are some. For example, we PKs are not born with some innate ability to sit quietly in church and appreciate every sermon ever preached. That is a learned ability, just like it is for everyone else. As a matter of fact, I remember well the first sermon that ever really caught my attention. It was a Christmas Eve in the mid-70s at the First Congregational Church of Hampton. My father told a Christmas story from the voice of one of the characters in biblical narrative. I was transfixed. That sermon, that sermon changed my understanding of Christmas in that moment, and it has colored my understanding of Christmas ever since. Now, in my career, I have written probably 12 or 15 of these first-person sermons, ranging from the perspective of an angel above the Bethlehem Hills to the donkey being ridden in the Palm Sunday parade. But there has always been something special to me about that one that I heard on that Christmas Eve long ago. Now, I know in 2020, we all need Christmas to hold us for a little longer this year. So this morning, I've decided to share with you this message written by my father, the Reverend Dr. Donald J. Rankin, that was entitled, I Was a Boy in Bethlehem. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I'm an old man now, and I've lived many a year. But I can remember, and I can remember quite well. I can remember when I was a boy in Bethlehem. For that is where I grew up, and that was my home. Now I know people say that Bethlehem is a beautiful city, but to be honest with you, I did not always think so. As I remember back, my memories of Bethlehem are those of a youth who was never really loved and never really wanted. There was this night, my parents were with a caravan, and we had stopped at an inn in Bethlehem, for it was along one of the main merchant trails. Oh yes, that is that same inn that you read about and hear about. But it wasn't very pretty then, and it probably isn't even very pretty now. Early the next morning, my parents arose with the rest of the caravan, and they left me there, a little child, and they left me there. The innkeeper, he found me and he kept me. I guess that's one of those strange things in my life that I never will really understand. Why he kept me? Because he really didn't come across as a kind man. But somehow, for some reason, he kept me. Maybe he thought I could do some work for him. Maybe he thought I could be of some benefit to him. I'm not really sure. But you know, it all kind of backfired on him. It didn't work at all. I remember that as I grew up, he put me to work in the inn. And there I was working one day, waiting on a table. And there was this beautiful woman, a fine woman in a radiant gown. She was there eating with other people. And I brought her some wine and she looked at me. And she knew that I was disformed. And she screamed at me and she cried, get this animal out of here. I learned something that day. 
I learned that neither clothes nor outside beauty really mean very much. It's what's in the human heart that is important. That is just one of the lessons that I learned in that inn. It wasn't very long before the innkeeper decided that I couldn't work inside the inn, so he put me to work out in the stable. I hated that too. Or at least at first I hated that. But somehow I accepted that like I accepted everything in my life, believing that God, if there was really a God, had separated me out from all the other people to hurt and to curse and to make my life bad. But it's strange how God works because it really wasn't all that bad. Pretty soon I actually began to like being in the stable. I didn't have to work with people. I could work with animals. And animals somehow get beyond what you look like. They know what's in your heart. And they love back. I've always wondered why in the world people couldn't do that too. I remember how the animals almost became like my brothers and sisters. I loved them, and they loved me, and we knew that. And it didn't matter what I looked like, and it didn't matter what I had or what I didn't have. They knew what that love was about. And it was good. But let me pause here for a moment and tell you about one night, a particular night. A night I will never forget if I live to be 500 years old. For it was a night that changed my life. It was midwinter and it was getting cold out as the hours passed on. And so I decided to get a little more hay and give it to the animals. As I was doing this, gathering up armfuls of hay and going about my way, I noticed a commotion out of the courtyard. And I peeked through the door to see what was going on. It had been a busy day, an extremely busy day. Pilgrims had been coming and going all day for Caesar had levied some tax. I just hoped and prayed that all this commotion would, be, would not mean that more people would be coming, more people whose animals I would have to care for. As I looked out, there were just two figures a man who was walking, and a woman sitting on an animal. I heard the man almost begging with the innkeeper, saying, we've got to have a room. Can't you see she can't go on any further, not even another step. Then I heard that grating voice of the innkeeper as he said, be gone with you, I want to go to sleep. There's no room here anymore. Leave me alone. The man begged on. He seemed to just be insistent that they had to stay. They had to stop right there and right then. Yet as the man looked at the woman, his anger seemed to melt away. He looked at her and asked, Mary, how are you feeling? For some reason, I guess I'll never truly know what it was. I ran to the door and I swung it wide open and I shouted, the stable, the stable. It's warm and it's clean. Why not come in here? We'll never forget the look of the innkeeper as he glared at me, almost with fear. You think I would have been used to that kind of hatred. I had experienced it so much. But this, this just pierced my heart. But that was broken because the woman spoke. She said, Joseph, the youth is kind. And she smiled at me. You know, that was the first time in my life anyone had ever smiled at me, that anyone had ever accepted me as a human being, that anyone had ever shown any kind of warmth or tenderness towards me. And that was important 
That was so very important. So I decided I had to do something, do something for her because I felt like she cared about me. So I ran again and grabbed up some more armfuls of hay and went to the furthest part of the stable away from the animals. And I put it down so that she could have a bed. And I took off my cloak and I laid it down for I knew the hay was prickling. And I wanted her to be comfortable. As the man and woman came in, I knew, I knew for the first time why the man had asked her how she was feeling. She was going to have a baby. She was going to have a baby. But even that moment was broken by bitterness and hatred. This time it was the innkeeper's wife demanding payment, demanding payment for a room, or if all the rooms were filled, surely the stable should be the price of a room. Didn't understand that, but I guess that's the way the world is. Not always fair and not always honest. Remember the innkeeper telling the man, we're just too busy. I have no one to send to help you. You'll have to do for yourself. And the innkeeper and his wife left. They left me there with these two people. The man looked over at me and said, son, can you help us? That was the second miracle of that night. First there was the warmth and love and now they were asking me Asking me to give of myself. No one had ever done that. No one had ever known me to be worthy of anything in life. And they were asking me to help. Asking me to care. Asking me to, to love as they had loved. And in that moment, in that moment, I would have done anything. It seemed like hours. Yet in the same time, moment it seemed like just seconds but I worked and I worked and I brought them a lantern and I brought them some water and I brought them whatever they needed to be comfortable shortly after midnight I returned from the inn and there was the mother with her baby the true miracle of that night and you know, that child was different from any child that anyone could have ever seen. That child seemed to enter the world as if he knew the world. All the hope and all the prayers, all the sins and all the cares of humanity seemed to be within that child. And there was a strange kinship, a strange kinship with me, and perhaps a kinship with all the world. Before long, the commotion started anew in the courtyard. And again, I went to look. This time there were groups of people, all kinds of people. And I thought, oh no, they're not going to break into this moment. But I listened and they were talking about a star in the heavens, a star showing the place where the savior would be born. Then I understood I didn't really understand because I had always believed that God would be in the temples. God would be where all the fancy people would be. God would be where all the beauty would be. God wouldn't be here. God wouldn't be here where I live. God wouldn't be in my life. God wouldn't be for everyday people. God couldn't be for me. Could God? Just, just think about it. The Savior born here in my home. I looked again and there were beautiful people. Even awestruck shepherds from the hills. They had all come to see the baby. The people entered. Slowly and reverently, but they entered. 
all kinds of people, men, women, youth, and children, poor and rich, people of all colors, people of all backgrounds, people like me, people who needed to know God. And they enter. Strange how people change, isn't it? Strange how people's attitudes and thoughts change. I can hear the innkeeper now as he brought the people in saying how wonderful he had been to this child to give him a place when everything was full and all of Bethlehem. How he had cared for him and brought him water. In the midst of all this commotion, the innkeeper's wife looked over and she saw my cloak. And she grabbed it up and she threw it at me and said, this isn't worthy of the Savior. You know, that was the first moment I had been cold. And it may have not been good enough for her, but that didn't matter. It was my cloak and I had loved and I had cared. And for the first time, I felt as though I was a person, a person of worth person who had reached out, and in spite of her bitterness, and in spite of her hatred, something wonderful happened to me that night. The mother, the mother looked at me once again, and she said, boy, thank you. Thank you. And my life was changed, never to be the same again, to be constantly different. Because God was now there. God had entered in. I told you that I'm an old man now. And that was so many years ago. And yet God, God has changed everything about my life. The way I understood myself, and the way I understood all of God's people. And I have heard of that baby. I have heard of what he has been about. How other people have known him to change their lives also. How he touched the poor people, the people in need, the sick, the people who didn't understand God. How he changed their lives and healed them. And I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that people could be so foolish. Even with all the hatred I had experienced and with all the rejection I had felt, I couldn't believe it when I heard they had killed him. I couldn't believe that sin could be so cruel that humanity would turn their backs on God. But the miracle, the miracle is that God is greater than all that. And the message, that Christmas message still lives. For the babe that was born in Bethlehem and the Christ that was crucified once again lives within the hearts of women and of men to change them as he changed me, not just in the past, not just for my life, but for each of us and for all time. For that baby boy, the baby boy who was born in that Bethlehem stable. For that Christ that is born anew in each of us, even this very day, to teach us of God's eternal love. I say this day, praise be to the living God. Praise be to the living God. Amen. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining.
Let us pray. Oh God, your light reveals to us all that any of us need. We have celebrated its arrival. Now help us see where it probes, understand what it illumines, and walk steadily on the path it shows us. And let your light put a radiance around our lives in this holiday season and in all our days and nights. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the Christ child bring. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconcile. Joyful all you saints arise, join the triumph of the skies. With angel hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the Christ child bring. Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time the Savior comes, offspring of the virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hailed incarnate deity. Pleased on earth with us to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the Christ child bring. Hail the bearer of God's peace, hail the Son of righteousness. Light and life our Savior brings, risen with radiant healing wings. Mildly laying glory by, born that we no more may die. Born to raise us all from earth, born to give a second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the Christ child bring. The Gospel of Luke tells the Christmas story in a narrative form. The story of a couple from Nazareth, an innkeeper, shepherds, angels, and a little baby in whom those gathered saw a divine incarnation. In contrast, the Gospel of John shares a much more theological birth narrative. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and lived among us, full of grace and truth. In him was life, and that life was the light of all. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has never been able to put it out. Friends, may you be so blessed as to have the witness of divine incarnation and the promise of overcoming light stir in your souls, not just this day, but in the days that lie ahead. Amen.